I'd like to, to go right to our second uh, lecture of the day. We're running a little bit behind schedule, uh, but uh, I think we should be okay. Uh, and I very much am looking forward to the lecture uh, of Ambassador Kodama. We've had the pleasure of actually working with the Embassy of Japan and also the Ambassador quite well uh, in Berlin. Uh, we've also had your Ambassador in Washington spoke at a conference we did last year at the German Marshall Fund. So I'm happy today to continue the tradition uh, with Japan, uh, and in particular to hear your perspectives on cultural diplomacy and global governance. Allow me to say a few words of background about His Excellency Ambassador Kazu Kodama. Uh, Ambassador uh, Kodama is currently the Deputy and Permanent Representative of Japan to the United Nations. Previous to his current position, Ambassador Kodama has served in the Economic Affairs Division of the United Nations Bureau, the Economic Cooperation Bureau, and as Principal Deputy Director and, uh, of the Overseas Public Relations Division of the Minister's Secretariat. Ambassador Kodama's uh, long di diplomatic career has include po included postings in London, Hong Kong, Washington, D.C., and New Delhi, among others. Furthermore, he has served in one of the European and Oceania Affairs Bureaus, has extensive press experience. And most recently, Ambassador Kodama was the Consul General of Japan in Los Angeles and Director General for Press and Public Relations for the Minister's Secretariat. Ambassador Kodama has degrees from the University of Tokyo and Oxford University in Law, Politics, Philosophy, and Economics. The lecture topic that he's chosen today is Challenges Confronting the UN. Democracy, Nationalism, and Secularism. If you could please join me in a very, very warm welcome for Ambassador Kazuya Kodama. Thank you. Okay. 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 Well, um, thank you, Mark. Um, well, let me uh, first of all extend my uh, most sincere uh, appreciation to you and the organization to kindly invite me uh, to present uh, my views on this topic, uh, which holds very dear in my heart. Uh, during the whole of my diplomatic career. But first of all, I think maybe, um, please, I think you have already, um, well, you have s s sat in this room for more than nearly two hours. So please feel free to wash your hands, to breathe uh, much fresh air outside uh, with a cup of coffee and come back. I, I don't think you will miss anything. I, I will just speak for a <laughs> while, okay? <laughs> now, uh, with that, uh, let me then start. Um, well, I think um, uh, the my previous uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Kri uh, Kridaka. Kridaka, I think uh, laid a good foundation, actually, also from my perspective, to, to really, uh, f for you to appreciate what I'm going to discuss uh, right now. Now, I, um, well, uh, the first of all, but at the outset, I would ask you to note that the views expressed in this speech are my own only and are not to be construed as indicating official positions of the Japanese government. This is just a caveat. Now, why have I chosen uh, to focus on these three ideas uh, in the context of the, the discussion under the heading of a culture of peace, cultural diversities, and all these things? Uh, is this. I wish to make the case today that the UN since its in inception, has steadfastly worked to promote both nationalism and democracy on a truly global scale. As to the objective of the advancing nationalism, the UN has been most instrumental in shaping the process of decolonization, notably in the 1960s, leading to the creation of scores of independent nation state in Africa, and helping them all to join the UN. At the same time, in that process of decolonization and later on in the process of the dissolution of the Cold War system in the 1990s, democracy as a system of electing, I define, a head of state and government either directly through one on one vote representation or parliamentary democracy has been almost universally universally adopted and put to the test by many newly independent states, as we all know. Standing now on the horizon of the 2011 and reflecting on the historic paths taken by many member states of the UN in the course of the trials of, uh, I say, anchoring democracy in their native soils, I cannot but help feel that the UN has overall been very successful in promoting and assisting democracy in many newly independent states in the world. The number of UN member states has increased from 51 
1945 to 193 in 2011. The number of the member states which have adopted the system of democracy in the form of parliamentary democracy or presidential democracy has now, I believe, exceeded the number that con constitutes an absolute majority at the UN, definitely over two-thirds of the UN member states. At the same time, one must also be candid and sober in the face of the challenges confronting us all now at the UN. On Syria, the UN Security Council thus far been incapable of taking any necessary and meaningful action to avert the further deterioration of the situation in the country. The Arab Spring has given us hope that people's desire to shape their future by themselves cannot be oppressed by power. Yet, there can be no doubt that the challenge of translating, translating democratic principles into a new constitution and building a new government is a daunting task for many countries indeed, including Afghanistan, Iraq, and countries in democratic transition such as Tunisia, Libya, Egypt. The euphoria of people who have earned democracy through huge human sacrifices is understandable. And their sense of nationalism is refreshingly strong and ardent. However, we must remember that when the newly earned democracy is matched with a fervent sense of nationalism, there is a real danger that people will become impatient with a slow process of a transition to democracy and lose sight of the fact that democracy cannot function based on the principle of majority rule alone. Majority rule cannot and should not be permitted to tamper on the fundamental rights of minority groups. But if this principle is neglected by the majority, there is a serious risk that democracy will become a so-called tyranny of the majority. We all know that many countries in transition to democracy are struggling with politically divisive fault lines, including sectarian, ethnic, and religious divides. In this respect, another point that I wish to stress today is that secularism could serve as an effective antidote to tyranny of the majority. A new challenge confronting the UN is how, is how to ensure that nascent or inchoate democracy will become sufficiently mature that a tyranny of the majority will be prevented. So this is the gist of what I plan to discuss this morning. Now, how has democracy been addressed at the UN from the very beginning? Let me start with the idea of democracy. In, in retrospect, it is fair to say that the way the value of democracy has been discussed at the UN was rather cautious at the outset. The UN was established in 45, 1945 with its original, original 51 member states. Those 51 original members were not able to incorporate the idea of democracy as a political system into the UN Charter. In a nutshell, the Charter was and is silent on the issue of the political systems adopted or to be adopted by its member states. The general understanding is that the political system of member states is a matter which is essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of the given state, Article 2, Paragraph 7. It was simply impossible for the 51 member states to uphold the value of the democratic political system based on one, man, one vote representation because some of those member states did not subscribe to such a system. To date, this situation remains unchanged. 
Now, during the period of decolonization and self-determination of African states in the 1960s, what the UN supported first and foremost was political independence, and independence with democracy was not an issue for the organization. However, in the 1990s, when the Eurasian continent witnessed the emergence of many newly independent states, the former Soviet republics included, the UN was active in providing assistance to those countries in transition to democracy. 20 years after the end of the Cold War, the world was jolted by the events collectively called the Arab Spring. The essence of the revolts which rocked the Arab world was homegrown democratic revolutions accomplished by the ordinary citizens in those countries. How, was, how has the UN been responding to the ongoing situations in the Middle East and the North African region? Now, the Security Council's presidential statement adopted on August 31st last year stated that, unquote, I quote, the only solution to the current crisis in Syria is through an inclusive and Syrian-led political process with an aim of effectively addressing the legitimate aspirations and concerns of the population, which will allow the full exercise of fundamental freedoms for its entire population, including that of expression and peaceful assembly, unquote. PRST 2011-16. And on February the 16th this year, just a week from now ago, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution with which, I quote, fully supports the League of Arab States January the 22nd, 2012 decision to facilitate a Syrian-led political transition to a democratic, plural political system in which citizens are equal regardless of their affiliations or ethnicities or belief, including through commencing a serious political dialogue between the Syrian government and the whole spectrum of the Syrian opposition under the League of Arab States or Species." Unquote. In the case of Yemen, the wording of the Security Council resolution adopted on October the 21st last year states that the Council reaffirms, I quote, its support for the presidential decree of September the 12th, which is designed to find a political agreement acceptable to all parties and to ensure a peaceful and democratic transition of power, including the holding of early presidential elections, unquote. Now, what is, what is clear from these statements by the Security Council and the General Assembly is that the UN of 2011 and 2012 right now is qualitatively different from the UN in 1945. The UN is silent, on, silent no more on the issue of democratic transition of its member states. It has stepped out of the confines of the self-imposed principle of non-interference in matters which states domestic jurisdiction and declared its support for a peaceful and democratic transition of power. So it is important to note in this connection that while silent on the issue of democratic transition of power in its early days, the UN nevertheless was proactive in addressing the issue of respect for human rights. Now on December the 10th, 1948, the General Assembly adopted the famous Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The fact that this document was adopted with eight abstentions and no, no votes was significant. The intent of this abstention by eight countries, namely USSR, Ukrainian SSR, Belarusian SSR, Yugoslavia, Poland, South Africa, Czechoslovakia, and Saudi Arabia, was to indicate that they reserved their endorsement of the application of the declaration to their respective peoples within their own jurisdictions. 
In this respect, it must be acknowledged that the geographical coverage of the declaration was not yet universal. Now the UN has the Human Rights Council, which was created by the UN General Assembly on March the 15th, 2006. The Human Rights Council can legitimately address situations of human rights violations in any UN member state and make recommendations on them. The UPR, Universal Periodic Review, is a unique process which involves a review of the human rights records of all 193 UN member states once every four years. Now, in 2012, this year, we are now able to say that fundamental human rights are universal and that violations of such human rights can no longer be left untouched by the UN. Article 21 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that, I quote, the will of the people shall be the basis of the authority of government. This will, this will shall be expressed in periodic and genuine elections, which shall be by universal and equal suffrage, and shall be held by secret vote or by equivalent free voting procedures, unquote. The democracy envisaged by the Declaration in 1948 has now attained, in my view, a position of proeminence pro in the mainstream of world politics. Today, so-called democratic space has expanded almost all over the world in a development never witnessed before in the history of mankind. One of the most difficult challenges confronting the UN at this juncture is then how, how to assist those countries in transition in anchoring democracy in their home soil. So for my next topic, I therefore turn to the issue of how to manage the issue of nationalism, lest it, lest it destabilize nascent democracies. In my discussion, I adopt a rather tautological definition of a nation as a group which identifies itself as a nation. As a, this reminds me of, reminds you also of the subjective nature of the concept of nationalism. Whatever concept of nationalism you try to define, it is subjective. Now, if a situation arises in which competing ethnocentric groups or sectarian groups do not share the same vision about their newly independent state, a dispute is destined to erupt. In the record of the UN to date, we have a history of the organizations of having struggled to restore peace and stability for nations plagued with inter-religious or inter-ethnic armed conflicts based on a very narrow nationalism. The role of the UN in resolving, for example, the Bosnia-Herzegovina dispute is one poignant case in point. In the book, in the valley between war and peace, written by Yasushi Akashi in 2007, former special representative of the Secretary General for former Yugoslavia, offers the following assessment. Post-Cold War inter-ethnic conflicts have been no less fierce and bloody than those between states. From its onset in 48, UN peacekeeping was based on the idea that a truce or ceasefire agreement between the parties to a conflict should be established and maintained through the separation of the combatants during a cooling off period, and the parties were encouraged to negotiate a more durable peace, taking advantage of the interlude provided. Faced with intense ethnic conflict in the former Yugoslavia, the UN first dispatched a peacekeeping force to Croatia. Amprofol was created by UN Security Council Resolution 743 on February 92. During the Croatian War of Independence, the mission was to monitor the four Serb inhabited areas in the east and the south of Croatia and to secure the withdrawal, withdrawal of Serb troops from these areas and their demil demilitarization. But the inter ethnic conflict soon spread from Croatia to. Bosnia-Herzegovina, Mr. Akashi points out that democracy consists of two pillars, 
majority rule and respect for minority rights. The ethnic composition in Bosnia was 44% Muslim, 31% Serb, and 70% Croat, with no single group possessing a clear majority. In the retrospect, we can imagine how horrendously difficult a task it must have been for the independent nation called Bosnia-Herzegovina to establish a democratic system in which all three ethnic groups, all three, would occupy a legitimate and dignified place with a sense of nation as Bosnian-Herzegovina rather than an ethnic, ethnocentric identity as Bosnian Muslim, Bosnian Serb, or Bosnian Croat. The track record of the Amprofol in Bosnia Herzegovina is a historic record as to how the UN struggled and muddled through to perform its mandate. Mr. Akashi was true to his mandate in Bosnia Herzegovina, which was to implement the UN efforts to maintain impartiality and neutrality principles in engaging to ensure provision of humanitarian assistance and non-expansion of military hostilities among the three ethnic groups. His position was often, and often challenged and looks untenable by the Bosnian government, which maintained that for the parties to the conflict, even humanitarian assistance was not a disinterested moral action, but rather an instrument to either weaken or weaken the position of their opponents or strengthen their own party, civilian as well as military. As the ethnic conflict in Bosnia-Herzegovina continued to escalate in 95, the UN Protection Force was faced with dilemma as to whether it could, it could, it could maintain its posture of impartiality and the minimum use of force in an increasingly hostile environment. And then, in July 95, in the so-called safe area of Srebrenica, more than 7,000 Muslim males were massacred by Bosnian Serb troops. Secretary General Kofi Annan presented a report on Srebrenica in 98. The report attributes the major part of the responsibility for the massacre in Srebrenica to the Security Council and the member states of the UN, which gave an impossible mandate to the UN PKO on the ground. While recognizing adherence to the principle of impartiality in the long history of PKO, Mr. Annan asserts that this principle is under trial and when faced with unmistakable evil, those concerned should adopt a posture somewhere in the middle between good and evil. As we all know, in the end, peace was achieved in Bosnia-Herzegovina by the Dayton Accord concluded in December 95. My point is this. There is no doubt that nationalism is a driving force for the sovereign independence of any state. Yet, the problem remains that nationalism can easily degenerate into exclusively inter-ethnic or inter-religious rivalries. In order that a newly independent state not fall into the snare of ethnocentric or fanatical nationalism, a full functioning democracy is needed. Let us remember, it is the norm rather than the exception that in this world of 193 UN member states, a great majority of independent nations are comprised of many diverse ethnic groups and groups of diverse religious affiliations. If a healthy sense of nationalism produces centripetal force to strengthen nationhood, a nation must strive to transcend the differences among different ethnic groups and groups representing diverse faith with a nurtured sense of enlightened nationhood. How, you may wonder, can this be achieved is this not an impossible task, you may ask? So now this is the next topic on which I would like to focus. My third topic, therefore, is secularism. The final point I wish to make today is that secularism in supporting, sorry, secularism would be crucial if the UN's intervention in supporting 
countries in transition is to be successful in the efforts to build democracy along with the stability of a nation. The UN's mandate consists of, as we know, we all know, of three pillars. Number one, to maintain international peace and security. Number two, to promote sustainable development for all UN member states, MDGs, and so on. And the third is to promote universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms for all, without distinction as to race, sex, language, or religion. I'd like to present a quick survey of relevant issues pertaining to the idea of secularism. The first issue concerns the separation of church and state. The biblical quotation, very famous one, I quote, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's, unquote, has become a widely cited summary of the appropriate relationship between Christianity and secular authority. The wording of the original message coming in response to a question as to whether it was lawful for Jews to pay taxes to Caesar gives rise to multiple possible interpretations concerning under what circumstances it is desirable for the Christian to submit to earthly authority. For the purposes of my presentation, it is sufficient to point out that this parable captures the importance of the issues of separation of church and state in the context of contemporary religion and politics. Recently, we witnessed a very interesting policy debate here in the United States about the clash between the government, which has introduced a new measure to ensure free access to birth control for all women and groups representing the Catholic Church, which oppose such a measure on the premise that endorsement of such a public policy to promote family planning violates their religious freedom. On February the 10th this year, President Obama announced that his government will resolve this dispute by allowing institutions affiliated with a religion to shift the cost of coverage for family planning and preventive health services to their insurance companies. Through this compromise, the government can say that the principle to provide free access to birth control to all women is preserved, while the relevant religious, religious groups can also maintain that their religious freedom has not been violated. Now, the famous Mexican poet, writer, and diplomat, Octavio Paz, wrote in his 1995 book, uh, Bis Lambres de la India, maybe in, in English, Glimpses of India that the legacy of Jawaharlal Nehru's rest with nationalism, sec secularism, and democracy. Mr. Potts served as Mexican ambassador to India for six years, from 62, 62 to 68. I am a student myself of India, my, having served two years as minister at a mission in India from 2001 to 2003. To rally the Indian people under the cause of their independence, nurturing a sense of nationalism was most effective. From the very beginning of Indian independence, secularism was firmly rooted in India. Professor Amartya Sen considers that there exists in the, in the country a well-established and unquestioning tradition of regarding secularism as a good and solid political virtue for a pluralist democracy. It is my strong belief that this vibrant secularism is the sine qua non of the stability, development, a robust democracy of India. India is a nation of people, amazingly diverse faith. Hindus, including over 800 million adherents, 80% of the population, Muslim, more than 13%, Christian, 2.3%, Sikh, 1.9%, Buddhist, 0.8%, Jains, Jews, Zoroastrians, and Baha'is. In India, democracy and secularism have functions in a relationship 
of mutual support and maintain the integrity of this vibrant secular nation in the face of recurring communal attacks. The story of Ayodhya leads all of us to a somber realization as to how difficult it is to apply the principle of respect for religious diversity in resolving the age-old enmity arising from historical rivalries between Hindus and Muslims in India. The Babali Masjid was a mosque in Ayodhya in Uttar Pradesh state. It was destroyed in 1992 when a Hindu political rally developed into a riot involving 150,000 people. Hindu extremists had been campaigning to get rid of the Babri Mas Mosque Masjid in Ayodhya, which had been a focus of Hindu-Muslim hostility for decades. They wanted to build a Hindu temple in its place to mark what they believed to be the birthplace of the Hindu warrior king, Lord Ram. On September 30th, 2010, the Allahabad High Court delivered a verdict that the disputed holy site in Ayodhya should be split between Hindus and Muslims. But both sides planned to appeal. In a majority verdict, judges gave control of the main disputed section where the mosque was torn down in 92 to Hindus. Other parts of the site will be controlled by Muslims and another Hindu sect. The issue is expected to continue to the Indian Supreme Court. The reason I have mentioned this incident is to convey my thoughts on how difficult it is, even for a robust secular state such as India, to navigate parties to a dispute to reconcile with each other through dialogue and mutual understanding, and thereby resolve a conflict arising from the historical rivalry and enmity between Hindus and Muslims. Another relevant issue is the question as to whether or, as to whether or a mosque should be allowed to be built in New York near Ground Zero. President Obama has stated that he believes that Muslims have the same right to practice their religion as anyone else in the UN, US. He adds that the right to practice religion includes the right to build a place of worship and a community center on private property in Lower Manhattan in accordance with local laws and ordinances. The president has not commented, on the other hand, on the wisdom of a decision to put a mosque there. This seems to me a clear case showing how a basic symmetry of treatment vis-a-vis -vis all religious groups ensured by a state can be applied in a concrete dispute. The important lesson to be learned from this dispute is that secularism is perfectly compatible with the state protecting everyone's right to worship as he or she chooses. Now in France, we know that laïcité, secularism in French entails the prohibition of even personal display of religious symbols or conventions in state institutions at work. In the case of Tunisia, prior to its democratic revolution last year, a secularism similar to the French interpretation was the norm. However, since the revolution, we hear that Islamists are demanding that Muslim students wear headscarves at state schools. It is a matter to be decided by the Tunisian people themselves <coughs> under their democratic system. Professor Sen's comment on this issue is, I believe, in enlightening. He maintains that the banning of an individual freedom to choose what to wear cannot be justified on the ground of secularism. If that principle is interpreted in terms of the need for the state to demonstrate neutrality among the different faiths, the important principle should be the freedom of each person individually to make his or her own decisions on what to wear. And I'm coming to an end of my presentation. Thank you for bearing with my long speech. I hope that you can agree at least with me that there are two principal, principal approaches to secularism. One is to focus on neutrality among different 
religious regions, and the other is to focus on the prohibition of religious expression in state activities. Every nation has its own history in the struggle between the state and religion. Each nation is entitled to have its own version of secularism. Which approach is more appropriate is not an issue. What is important is to practice secularism in such a way as to promote the vibrancy of both democracy and nationalism, and to embrace the virtues of tolerance and diversity. From this perspective, it is my contention that the United Nations must do more to promote secularism, focusing on the virtues of tolerance and respecting religious diversity. I respect, I respect your faith in, in your God. In return, you respect my faith in my God. If this precept is ensured and accepted, banning the Korans could not, should not have happened as it happened in Afghanistan most recently. Here at the UN, the member states have engaged for nearly a decade in the issue of the promotion of a culture of peace and tolerance and improvement of overall relations among people from different cultural and religious backgrounds and among nations. Now, the UN Millennium Declaration of September the 8th, 2000 regards tolerance as one of the fundamental values essential to international relations in the 21st century. It also urges us to undertake active promotion of a culture of peace and dialogue among civilizations. The year 2005 World Summit outcome adopted at the high-level plenary meeting of the General Assembly takes the view that all cultures and civilizations contribute to the enrichment of humankind and acknowledges the importance of respect and understanding for religious and cultural diversity throughout the world. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today I have shared my thoughts on what I believe to be one of the most pressing issues the UN is required to address. In a nutshell, I believe that the UN has come a long way towards bringing about a near universal space of democracy on Earth. In a way, we may be closer to the end of the era of nationalization of democracy. We may be entering into a new era, new era of democracy aligned and strengthened in an ever more transnational setting. With that, I think I leave you to just ponder more on this issue. I thank you for your attention. Um, I'd be delighted if you have any questions or criticism of my views, whatever. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>